All right, the live stream is up. Let me grab a link and post it for our peoples. Hey, Richie, you ever shopped at a place called Norm's Rare Guitars in Los Angeles? I've wanted to go there, but I've never had the chance to. Dude, you have to do it. You have to do it. That guy is crazy. The stuff oh, he's yeah. got. <laughs> Almost there. You were only five minutes late. For me, that's a uh, that's saying something. That's all we're my fault. Awesome. Sorry, guys. Ah, it's fine. No, we're normally five <laughs> to ten minutes late. Just whenever we're not doing anything but being ourselves. So, gotcha. <laughs> so, do we have a um, like a structure of are we going to do? what regular well, stuff and not regular stuff or how are we can do it so that was the question i was going to ask you richie how, how long are you in for uh, or do you just want to do like a 30-minute interview and cut out or are you willing to to go the whole uh, weird experience with us how long do you guys usually go um anywhere from an hour to to hour 45 usually yeah Oof. um i could probably stick around for an hour or so okay okay i mean we this is all about you, so... Uh, oh, I, yay. <laughs> <laughs> do you um, want us to do... Hey, Mark, do you want to do the... Like we did before? We'll yeah, we'll front load it. We'll do the warm-up stuff after we've done the... Yeah. The, the thing? Okay. Hold on. I can't get logged in here. Why must Chrome suck so much? Because you didn't pay for it. Because Google is mad because you have another browser on the computer <laughs> with Chrome. <laughs> Prove me wrong. <laughs> I can't. Your logic is sound. I'm just, I'm just waiting, literally waiting for Chrome to get attacked together. The stream is up, by the way. I'm just posting it on our page. Um, So what we'll do is we'll just sort of freeform this. Uh, we'll we'll interview you for as, as until you get tired of answering questions, um, and then uh, when you're ready to cut out, we'll go back and just do our noodly stuff. All right. Just load the page. That's all I'm asking you to do, Chrome. Just load the page. <laughs> it's all you do. It's your one job. You had one job, yeah. Chrome. So, Richie, have you listened to any of our episodes? Clearly not. He's here. I'm coming in cold, so no, I, I haven't. All right. <laughs> he would not be here had he listened to one of our shows. No, he would love it. <laughs> <laughs> However, I've been listening to your Band Geek podcast, and uh, the Rosanna episode was fascinating. Oh, thank you. Opening yeah, the kimono we, we there was great. pretty stupid for picking that song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Toto Royal. <laughs> you guys seem so, to master so pretty much anything. Done, and <laughs> as hour three was rolling around, me and uh, Andy were like, why do we just do this? Yeah. We could just pick the song we've been done with already. Stupid. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It was like, you know, the, the, the live stream ends in 10 minutes. We've got to do this. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to uh, work this on the fly because it's still not working and I'm not going to make you wait anymore. Uh, so I, we will test my multitasking abilities. Um, so what we're going to do here is, uh, we, like I said, we'll go out of order. So if I mention something as if it has happened, though it hasn't happened, just go with it um, okay. and pretend because by the time it all goes out, it will have happened. Uh, do you want me to start recording on my, uh, my end here? Yes, sir, please. Okay, I am recording now. Processing vocal retrieval units. Yeah, I'm on. <laughs> I always try to come up with something stupid to say when instead of just say I'm recording because you know. Oh yeah. Um. All right. Okay, so here we go. Um, 
I'm just going to start, uh, you know, very basically, uh, and and um, we have, you know, a whole show notes thing that I didn't put anything in there uh, because, this, like I said, this is really all about you. So I'm just going to start with you and uh, say, hey, Richie, first, thanks for being with us. Um, it's a uh, it's always a, a good thing to have a guest on, but uh, when the guest is as notable as you are, it's even better. Uh, so let's just start out with uh, introduce yourself. Uh, who is Richie, Richie Castellano, and, and what makes you so notable? Uh, notable, wow. Okay, <laughs> my name is Richie Castellano. I'm a musician from New York. I uh, have a podcast called Band Geek. It's on the Riotcast Network, and uh, it's about blending my love of nerd culture and music. And when I'm not doing that, I am the current touring guitar player and keyboard player in the legendary rock band Blue Oyster Cult. And I wear a lot of other hats besides those two. I'm an active YouTuber, uh, but those are the big ones. I, I love how you put notable. <laughs> you put podcaster first, rock star second. That's that's awesome. <laughs> Podcasting takes more work, as you know. <laughs> Indeed, right? It's it's more of a pain. <laughs> Uh, so Miles is one of those uh, uh, interesting guys who every now and then just drops, you know, uh, fascinating things about you. Like, you know, oh, by the way, you know, I used to arm wrestle with Fidel Castro in middle school. Um, and and one of the he 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 knew somebody who knew you. And uh, and this all came about because of a discussion we had a little while back about the the bridging the gap between the artificial and, and the and the real. Uh, so uh, we talked specifically about amp modeling, among other things, and uh, that's where you came in. And he saw you live and saw you, uh, you know, uh, literally an A-B test alongside a guy who's using, you know, a bunch of quote-unquote real equipment and you using the virtual equipment. And so that's sort of how, how you came to be with us. So talk a little bit about that, you know, um, that part of your musicianship. How do you get to be... Um, uh, to blend the digital and and the artistic in such a way that that this little box at your feet sounds like you know a, a classic cabinet, for example. Um, well, I guess first I can give you guys a little backstory onto the why, uh, which I think is important. I was raised as a blues guitar player in a house with my, a father who was a blues guitar player who has a spectacular tube amp, a vintage tube amp collection. Of he has almost every model of '60s Fender many in pristine condition, and that's really important to him. And some of that rubbed off on me. And even though I wasn't going for some of those uh, classic, like, soulful blues tones, I was going for more hard-edge rock stuff, I still liked the tubes. So I went through plenty of iterations of different rigs uh, with based around tube guitar amps. And when I finally started playing with Blue Oyster Cult and they moved me over to, the, to guitar, which that's another story, uh, I was using rental gear, and I was using rental Marshalls and Mesa Boogies. And, you know, Marshalls and Mesa Boogies sound great, but not when 500 other people have been beating them up all year long and they haven't been maintenanced. And then you get these weird amps that sound ratty and broken, and your tone is just crap for the entire show. So I got really tired of this, uh, using the rental gear. So I'm thinking, all right, it's... I think it must have been like 2010 or something when I switched. I said, technology has to be getting better now to where I don't have to deal with this anymore. This is ridiculous. I spend most of the sound check just trying to get these terrible amps to sound good. So I actually just took a shot in the dark and I bought a Line 6 Pod HD 500, which was a few hundred bucks. I think it was like under $500, which isn't that bad. And, you know, I sort of looked down on it when I first got it because... I said, oh, you know, I'm a tube guy, I like real amps, but now I'm forced to use this, you know, it seemed like a toy to me. You know, it, and I think the reason and the perception of it being a toy is the price point because it's inexpensive. So when something's inexpensive, you think, oh, this can't be good. But, you know, I was wrong. After It, it took an adjustment period. I, I'd say like six weeks or so or maybe more of me just fidgeting with the thing. I finally started getting some really good tones out of it. And, and at first it was like a hybrid. I was using the pod as just a front end uh, with a real power amp and a real cabinet. I brought, I brought a solid state 1,000 watt power amp with me, uh, class D, so it was only like eight pounds, which was great for airline travel. And we were using a rental 412 cabinet. And that was great. And after just a refining process, I got it to a point where I really was happy with it. And then every night I just 
had a very similar sound, and that's what you want when you're touring. But uh, then the Helix came out, which is, uh, there's, it's funny because Line 6 was the pioneer of this modeling technology, this guitar modeling. When I say modeling, if I'm not sure how educated everybody, all your listeners are to what this is. Uh, so should I explain what that is? It's always best to assume we know nothing. Okay. Um, so what modeling is, you, okay, there's traditional guitar amps. You plug into the guitar amp. Uh, there's tubes or transistors in it that make it go. What modeling does is it's digitally capturing this sound so you can take it with you in some sort of digital device, plug your guitar into it, and play through the digitally replicated version of that sound. That's a simple explanation to what modeling is. It's it's capturing the amp uh, in digital the digital world. Uh, so you don't have to carry this huge amp with you. It's in some sort of box or computer or whatever. So Line 6 really pioneered this technology and had the first decent-sounding gear with their pod, which was like this kidney-shaped big red thing, and it sounded sort of good, uh, but it wasn't as good as the real thing. And they sort of fell behind because other companies like uh, Fractal, who makes a device called the Axe Effects, which is really great, or uh, Kemper, which is another great device. It's a profiling amplifier that you can actually capture your own amps. And there's a company, I think it's from France, called Two Notes, that they all do wonderful, wonderful digital models of these amps. And Line 6 was sort of not really competing in that arena until last year when they introduced this thing called the Helix, which um, was priced competitively, so it was considerably more money than the pod, and it had all the bells and whistles that you could ever want. And with that, it also gave you the ability to load impulse responses, which is a big deal. An impulse response is something that it's, it's a method of capturing. It's like modeling, but it's something like a modeling procedure that you can do yourself. So to do an impulse response, you take your favorite speaker cabinet, you mic it up, and you send a pulse through it. And sometimes it's like white noise or a um, oscillating wave, like a uh, And then you mic that up, you record that into the computer, it captures that as an impulse response, and it saves it as like a, a, like a second or two wave, a very small file. And you load that into your modeling device, and then you can play through the sound of that cabinet that you just that speaker cabinet that you just captured. It's really awesome, and Line 6 hadn't done that in a while, so they just added that capability to this, and that was really attractive to me, as well as all the interfacing and user-friendly features and touch-sensitive screens and all this crazy stuff. So I just you know, bit the bullet and I bought it. And I was amazed by how much easier it was to program and how quickly I was able to get sounds up and running and what happened is I liked it so much, I eventually ditched the cabinet, I ditched the power amp. So now when I play, it's my guitar into a wireless, into the Helix, into the PA system. The end. That's it. All right, so let's talk about the, that ease of, of programming. So mm -hmm. you're you're wandering around a pawn shop in upstate New York, and you find this vintage Marshall just sitting there, and you, you think, this is the perfect thing, I have to have it. You buy it, you bring it home. How long before plug it in, plugging it in at your home uh, do you have that modeled and ready to go? I don't actually model the stuff myself uh, because uh, if you have something like the Kemper, which I mentioned before, that's a profiling app. That actually... That, that hardware comes with the capability for you to actually model or profile your own amplifier. The the Helix doesn't do that. They okay. give you like 30 or so amps to choose from, and then you can load your own speaker cabinets. So uh, you you really can't do that with the Helix. I've done that with, uh, I have another device that I use sometimes here called the Two Notes Torpedo Cab, and that allows you to make your own impulse responses. And I've, you know, sampled one of my own amps that, that way. But with the Helix, it, it's, that's not what it does. Uh, but you have to sort of trust that if there's a sound you want, you can use the tools available to get close to it. So if I have uh, the vintage Marshall and I know I need that sound for something, if I, if I you know, futz around with the Helix enough, I should be able to get close. All right. So it, it sounds like it must be the, the perfect uh, op option for... A traveling musician. You need a, a small flight case, your guitar case, and you got everything you need. Yeah, I mean, for for me, it's great because uh, I understand why a lot of people are hesitant to embrace this technology because I have a background not only as a guitar player but as an engineer. 
I went to school for audio engineering. So for me, when I see this toy box with all these, you know, pro, uh, EQs and compressors side by side with all the distortion, wah, and echo pedals, like that's fine for me. Like that's that's my whole process. That's my whole signal flow right there. But um, a lot of guitar players are sort of slow to embrace this because for them, it makes more sense to bring a pedal board with some of their favorite analog stomp boxes and plug into a rental Marshall or Fender Deluxe, and that's their sound. And they can, for for them, all they need is a basic clean sound. And I understand that, and I, I'm, I don't knock that. But for me personally, I just want consistency, especially uh, since we use in-ear monitors. I don't want the microphone to be a factor. I don't want the rental amp to be a factor. I want to hear what I want to hear every night. I want to focus on playing and not on why does this amp not sound good, you know? Hey, Richie, you've got you, – I'm um, taking the liberty here of assuming you, you're plugged in right now with a guitar in front of you. Yep. Are you able to give any of our listeners a couple of variations on different tones and sounds that the modeler is able to give? Sure. You just ask so, a guitar player to play guitar. Really? Yeah, you well, think he's going to say no to that? It's all good. <laughs> uh, so here's a basic clean sound. Let me see what amp I have loaded here. And, but while you're doing that, is that a Millennium Falcon guitar behind you? Uh, no, it's actually a USS Defiant okay. bass uh, made by one of the oh. listeners of our show, a, a gentleman named John Johnston. He has his own wood shop in his garage, and he knows I'm a big fan of Deep Space Nine. Uh, and so he made me this really cool bass. It lights up, and the nacelles fire. It's pretty uh, awesome. That's even cooler. Yeah. I, I also have this in my studio just in case, just to you know balance things out. You have right. to have Star Wars and Star Trek. Uh, represented. So here's a lightsaber. Good, good. Cool. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's a clean sound using a Fender twin sort of thing with delay and chorus. Right, before you do that, hold on. I need yep. to pause for just two seconds for technical glitch. Hold on. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, take it away. So here's a model of, or an example of a Fender twin, and I have some compression, chorus, delay. Uh, here's something with a little more grit to it. This is based on the famous Dumble amplifier. Kick the game up a little bit. Throw a little tremolo in there for a vintage sort of thing. Then for more of the hard rock stuff, I have a Soldano amp. Uh, these aren't Soldano, these aren't the actual amps, but they're what they're based on. <laughs> It's like a very meat and potatoes rock and roll sound that you can play most of the night with. You can kick up some gain on there. And here is my kill sound. This is uh, based on, I think, a PRS Archon. I just want to point out to people who may not uh, be musicians, may not have spent thousands of hours listening to different amplifiers, and, and he's not just uh, changing the effects, not just changing uh, the different m things that he's doing to the, the same sound. He's actually modeling different tones, different uh, physical qualities of different amps, and, and those people who recognize those amps will, will know how dead on that sound is. But it's, it really goes beyond just uh, adding a chorus or adding some distortion or something like that. It's it's completely um, uh, recreating a physical spectrum of equipment. Yeah, and another thing to, to uh, keep 
in mind with this. And, you know, I get into debates with people on in YouTube comments and all that stuff, uh, is that this is one example of these amps. Because if you have, if you put three Marshalls in a room, the same model, they're all going to sound different. So they're different examples of these classic tones. And another thing that guitar players usually have trouble with is the sound of their mic'd amplifier. Because a lot of us, you know, me too, when I get my amp, I want to put it on 10, go in my, my studio and just crank it and let the, let the wall shake. But that sound and that feeling you get is a lot different than the feeling or the sound of putting a microphone right up to the speaker. And that's the sound where, with the modeling gear that you're trying to capture is that micro, mic'd up speaker sound. Wow. You know, I, I, Mark, you had said before, I mean, I, uh, Richie, I'd seen you guys play in San Diego in January. Mm -hmm. um, it was a casino. I can't remember the place. And what was mind-boggling when you are in the audience watching this sort of thing was to see, so just to describe for the listeners, when Blue Oyster Cult play, you've got, what, uh, five? No, six players. How many you got? Uh, five guys. Five guys. I'm sorry. Okay, so you're on uh, what stage left? No, mm -hmm. you're on whatever. Oh, sta stage right. You're on stage right. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at it from the yeah. Anyway, you're on stage right. You've got the legendary Buck Dharma, Don Rosa, the guitar, the guitarist from the heavens, is on the other side of you, and he's playing pretty much analog, right? He's got um, a it not a hundred percent. Oh, it, okay. There's um. Okay, I also did a video on this on my YouTube channel. If you check that out, we did a whole gear rundown for everybody in the band. He's all he's mostly analog except for like his um, he has all analog stomp boxes. Um, he's using the preamp section from a Marshall amp, and his effects are digital. I mean, his uh, his delays and reverbs are coming from an old uh, Lisa's Quadriverb, and his he's not using a cabinet. He's using a two notes torpedo, the um, the rack version that also acts as a load box for the amp. So the it's mostly analog up until the speaker section that is modeled. Right. Okay. So what I noticed from the audience side of things is that his sound feels fairly warm, mm -hmm. and your sound feels far more cultured. Like, and I mean, you can adjust specifically to it. He, and I was, he uses being the lead guitar player. He can he can use um, sort of one main sound for most of the gig, and that's his voice. You know what I mean? Coming through the guitar. Right. Uh, right. It's my job to fill in the little cracks. So I'm always trying to change things up where I can complement what he's doing. And and when I'm not now, look, other side men, uh, they have to be in gigs where they never get spots like lead spots or just some some spotlight time and that's fine but this band is not like that buck is very giving very generous um there's no ego to deal with he he knows he's awesome and he's happy to let the other guys in the band shine so he'll give me a spot but when i'm not taking a solo spot my job is to stay out of his way and it's not it's not like he came up to me one day and said hey kid stay out of my way it's just like i know this that okay he's occupying this sonic spectrum. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be the guy covering up Buck Dharma at a Blue Oyster Cult concert when people came to hear him. So I try to make sure my rhythm sounds have a little bit of a scoop to them just to leave room for his mid-range information. I try to make sure my clean sounds have some sparkle to them because I, you know, like we all want him to occupy the focal point. And I'm and like you noticed, I'm trying to just get different colors in the palette there. So I don't step on him, but I still enhance and add something interesting to the, yeah, the finished product. But you do much more than that, though, because I, I noticed, I think in one of your Band Geek podcasts, you'd mentioned that he his output's stereo and your output's mono. Yes. Okay. And that's probably why it felt that way in the audience. Mm -hmm. And having listened to that and sort of looked at it, I, I started realizing that you know, I've been what been listening to Blue Oyster Cult since I was a kid, and I kind of you know went through all the albums and everything. So I'm you know very obviously a fan, but the lineup constantly changed over the decades, and 
with with you guys, the, the your input, the um, Jules on drums, and whether it's you know Danny or or Kasim on bass, you've provided them a uh, uh, if you like a foundation and lifts them up and they yeah. are so much more pronounced because of what you guys do underneath them that you've taken a couple of guys who were legends who could have easily been sort of legends in their time and you've retained their position by, f by pushing them up. I don't know if you realize how well you've done that, but well, it's I really astounding. appreciate you saying that. And that's, that's the gig. That's what we try to do. I mean, that's on our minds all the time. Uh, is we want to make not only the song sound good, but whoever is singing the song or playing the lead, like we're we're there to make it as powerful as possible. And and I I appreciate you saying that because that's something we we work very hard on on doing. Well, I think you also add so much more to it because um, you know, for the listeners who haven't seen uh, one of your. Uh, shows before they should I mean that's just a, a given but the second part of it is that you your personal contribution is so strong that it's given a whole new breath of life to that band and it's phenomenal I mean it's absolutely outstanding to see you guys especially when you do songs where you and Buck are both sharing a lead like Vigil or something like that mm -hmm. um it's crazy cool. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> amazing. So I, well, I got to give you guys props to that. It's brilliant. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I mean, that it, overall, that seems to be the uh, the feeling I'm getting from the people who are big fans of the band, and I I love that. That's great because I'm you know I'm trying to when I get like like I said before right, when I get a spot I'm trying to hit the marks, but when it's when it's time for Buck or Eric to do their thing, I'm just trying to be in support mode. So I appreciate that. And I mean, really, it's, it, I mean, it's their gig. It's not my gig. So I'm trying to really focus on them. But there are some people, and I've seen some YouTube comments where it's like, why is this idiot taking a solo? I came here to see Buck talk about <laughs> <laughs> So I get some of that too, but it's, it's mostly positive stuff. I, I can't complain. <laughs> Buck needs to rest a few measures every now and then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Give the guy a break, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I want to transition, if I could, into uh, what you what you self uh, proclaimed as your first job, your your YouTube slash podcast career. Um, how did which which came first, the the chicken or the egg? Did you did you start uh, as a touring musician who found YouTube? Did you start as a YouTuber who found touring? How did that work? I started okay when I came out of college. I didn't. I had no plans of playing in a rock band at all. I just didn't think it was going to happen for me. I don't look like a rock star. So, and that's sort of important. So I didn't see that happening. Uh, so I focused on audio engineering and production and trying to write songs and all that good stuff. And I got involved with Blue Oyster Cult through audio engineering as a sound guy. And then after subbing for them as their front of house sound engineer, I eventually was able to jump in there when they had uh, an emergency vacancy on bass. And then I got moved over to guitar and keyboards a few years, years later um so when i was moved over to guitar and keyboards to replace me on bass they ended up getting the incredible and legendary rudy sarzo who played with ozzy uh white snake quiet riot dio to name a few uh and you know he's a real rock star but he's also a very brilliant guy and he would while we would all play video games and and, you know, read whatever. He was always watching tutorials on 3D animation or, do, or trying to learn, like, a new skill. And I admired that. So Rudy gave me probably the best piece of advice anyone's ever given me. And this is a piece of advice that I tell a lot of young musicians, whether they listen to me or not. Uh, we were just talking, and he said, oh, you know, do you have a YouTube channel? I said, oh, uh, I don't think so, no. He says, you don't put videos on YouTube? I said, no, I don't. He goes, if you, in this day and age, and I think it was like 2006 or seven or something when he said this to me, he said, if you don't have a YouTube channel, you don't exist if you're a musician. Yeah. And, I'm, and I, that was really a tough pill to swallow because all of my skills were geared toward sound and audio. And I didn't want to make music videos. I just wanted to make songs and, and recordings, audio. And 
you know, on his recommendation, I set up a YouTube account and I started looking through old camcorder recordings and just started dumping stuff on YouTube. And another thing that really got me into all this, I'm the 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 name of your podcast is very fitting because I, I'm a big geek. I I recognize that I'm a geek, and as soon as I sort of came to terms with the fact that I'm a geek, my life got better. Because when you're a geek and you're in denial, that stinks. Because you're trying to be something you're not. And I'm sure we all know someone who's like that. And like, well, you know, you're a giant geek, but you're pretending you're not. You're trying to be cool, and it's just making everything worse. We call those closet geeks. Yeah, closet <laughs> geeks. I I have no time for them. So like you. Are you a geek? Be free with your geekdom. But uh, so a thing that I did, and this, this is all related. This is a weird, long story, so please indulge me. Um, when I joined the band, Eric told me, he was like, okay, you're in a rock band now. you gotta, you got to try to lose some weight and get in shape. And he said, I saw a great special on TV about kung fu. Maybe you should go do kung fu. I know you like martial arts movies and stuff. I said, okay, sure. So I went to a local kung fu school. And I started studying, and I really liked it. And and I got a lot of my friends involved. So at one point, like 10 of my friends were all going to this kung fu school. And we were hanging out one day, and I said, you know what? Let's go in my backyard, and let's film us fighting. Just, you know, I said, we're all taking kung fu. We're all badasses now. We should be able to, like, you know, do some cool moves. So I, I, t- I looked at the video. I, we recorded this stuff. I looked at the video. I'm like, wow, this is not very cool. It's just kind of pathetic and silly looking. So what I did is I took that and I put d- poorly dubbed sounds and horrible sound effects on it, and I made a story, and I made this kung fu movie just for me and my friends. And it was very funny, and, we, and it was a big goof. And then more people started seeing it, like my friends started sharing it, and they all started saying, I want to be in the next one. So... We, we made more, and everyone got more and more complicated and more involved and cost more to make. And at this point, we'd made nine of them. And they're called the Tiger's Fang, and Eric Bloom from Blue Oyster Cult in one of them. Buck Dharma's in one of them. My wife is, is a character. Uh, that we, a lot of my friends, and it's mostly, I'd say, 90% musicians are the fighters and the actors in, in these movies. So I showed Rudy... This, 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 believe me, this is all connected. I'm getting there. So I showed Rudy the Kung Fu movie, and he said, that's great. And at one of our gigs, the people from Sony Creative Software were there. And Rudy said, Richie, show them your Kung Fu movie. I'm like, what are you, crazy? I'm not showing them that. That's private. He said, no, no, show them the movie. So I showed them the movie, and they said, this is amazing. Can we repost this on our website? I said, uh, I guess. They said, they said okay, you need, they said, you need better production. Um, Give, give us your address. And they sent me the whole software suite and the sound effects library just to make more kung fu movies. So doing those stupid kung fu movies taught me about filmmaking and, and cameras and editing. I learned all that stuff from that stupid project. And then when I, when I started, I moved my focus back to music again. I did a, a video cover version of ABC by the Jackson 5. And I used all of those editing skills I learned to do that. And then I sort of refined it a little more. And then the next video I made was a uh, split-screen cover of Bohemian Rhapsody, which, which went viral. And my only video to, go, to, do, to have that happen where the counts on YouTube actually get stuck while they verify that they're real. And that's, up, that's over one and a half million views right now for that video. But it's all connected. All, and that's the thing I try to do. Anytime... I pursue a geek passion or hobby. I try to bring it back into music, and that's what the whole band geek thing is about, is how it's all connected. You know, the kung fu movies, without the kung fu movies, I would never have done the split-screen music videos, which led to so many other musical things for me, and that was really amazing. Uh, the, so really the YouTube stuff came first, and the podcast came. I, there was a brief time where I was taking, I had a straight job, uh, I was working for American Musical Supply as their product demonstrator. I did that for a, a little over a year. And I had this crazy commute to work, and to pass the time, I started listening to podcasts. And being a ham and, and an egomaniac, I said, oh, I can do this. <laughs> so I, uh, 
I called some people. I got involved with the Riotcast network because I knew a guy who was who who helps run that, or he who was one of the, the co uh, founders of that, and he got me set up. And I would I did the podcast, and you know I, I didn't know it was for me, but I'm sure you guys know it takes a while to sort of hit your stride and figure out what your show actually is, because at the at, at you know your first few shows you're copying everybody else's show and you're not sure what you're doing, and now I've sort of just realized that the Band Geek podcast, it's, it's me and whatever I'm into that week, and everybody seems to be okay with that. So cool. And so what <laughs> what I have heard you do uh, repeatedly is, is you get uh, what sounds like 53 people um, in your basement, and you play a song. <laughs> uh, how, do, do you have like a TARDIS in the bottom of your house? Is that how that happens? No, yeah, it's very I uncomfortable. Gonna, <laughs> I was going to ask you, how many square foot is your basement? It's, it's so small. It's horrible. It, it, I haven't measured it, and I should, but it's it's really. It, it, I live um, I live in the suburbs of Staten Island, and uh, real estate is expensive, and this is the best I could do. <laughs> <laughs> but you get so, six musicians in there for a band geek. How, yeah, we, how you... uh, everybody comes because we use wide angle lenses on the the cameras, so people uh, come down here and and they go, oh, I said yeah, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> just squeeze over here in the corner, and. You know, I, I try my best to make everybody comfortable, but it is what it is. And and sometimes people ask me, oh, hey, I see you have so-and-so on the show. Can I come down and hang? I say, no, there's <laughs> literally nowhere for you to sit. You can't come over. Like, we have – it's like a seven-person m- limit. That's it. Like, after seven people, no one else can come here. Watch it on YouTube like everybody else. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so you're up to uh, – I just checked – 112 episodes now. So you've yep. been doing this uh, two or three years probably, I'm guessing. Um, yes. And so do you feel that uh, that you have hit your stride, that this is the thing that you're going to do for, you know, the foreseeable future with the Band Geek podcast? I want to I, – I, that's a tough question because I do like what we're doing, but I also want to change it to become more YouTube-centric because I feel like podcasts are sort of – like the golden age of podcasts is behind us. And the people who got in at the right time – the uh, Mark Marin, Joe Rogan, Nerdist, Kevin Smiths, like all those guys, you know, they're, they're established. And also doesn't ha- doesn't hurt that they're famous. Right. But um, uh, they're they're the they're at the top. It's hard to approach that with podcasts. Um, and I feel like the majority of my viewers or listeners are experiencing what we're doing through YouTube. So I think in the future. We're probably going to try to shift what we do more toward visual and less towards just like a long form audio thing. But I, this is something I've been talking about for a couple of years and I haven't done it yet. So we'll, we'll see. I've heard a lot of people, uh, new podcasters say, you know, how do you get to be a famous podcaster? I say it's really simple. First book, I'm famous, then start yeah. a podcast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it helps. I mean, we're the numbers are growing and it was sort of depressing when, it, you know, you can probably – you probably know what I mean, but when you first start a, pro- a podcast, the numbers are de- depressing. Like, oh, I thought all these people are going to listen. Yeah. Um, but it grows slowly. Uh, the key with anything is consistency, and being a touring musician, that's something that's just sort of impossible for me to be able to do one every single week. But we, we try to be consistent, and we've been doing it. We've been more consistent lately because I'm really trying to just crank them out. Wow. Seth, you yeah, haven't I'm, said a word. Do you have any questions? Yeah, guys. Um, not really, because like music's not my thing, so I'm just letting y'all Me neither. handle it's okay. this one. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I, I, I do have Star one question. Yeah, no, I do I'm, have one I'm question totally though. Okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, about the music though, do you find that does anybody push back and say I don't like that little thing you're doing? Can you bring your amps on stage? Or oh, yeah. are, are, are there any purists out there? Do they give you a lot of grief? Yes, absolutely. I did uh, purists or trolls. I don't know what term you want to use. Uh, <laughs> almost like one of the same. Uh, okay, so look, and that's why when I d- described this earlier, I have to put the disclaimer. I love tube amps. They're great, but I can't use them in this situation. I always have to say that because people – here's here's what it comes down to. If I post a video talking about how great some sort of digital – technology is that replaces a tube amp there's going to be someone who is a you know blues guitar enthusiast who reads all of the guitar 
forums, who knows everything about everything, every tube amp, who, you know, you have to have a 60-something Les Paul and this Vox AC30 and you have to switch, you know. Okay, great. And, and I have, look, the difference with the two points of view is I think that's great. Like, I think if you have a tube amp and, and it sounds awesome and that's getting the results you want, that's awesome. I have absolutely no problem with it. And I'll never go to someone's video who, who, saying, oh, how could you use a tube amp? You should be doing this with a Helix or, a, or an Axe FX. I, I, I won't do that. There's no point. But these guys feel compelled to go search out videos uh, <laughs> with the modeling tech and, and just poop on it. They just, I mean, sorry, but that's what it is. Like, and they have to you know, publicly do it and make a big deal and, and cause, like a, cause a, a situation. For example, uh, I had a gig. It was um, a couple weeks ago. And I had to do all Queen music, so I did. A, I figured, you know, this is a sort of a cool opportunity to do a video uh, showing how I would make Queen sounds with my guitar uh, and, and the Helix. Uh, and so I started. And here's what I came up with, by the way. <laughs> so sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and, um, that's really good. Uh, and some guy was just like, "This sounds like garbage." Uh, you, you're cheating the audience. How could you do this? And I'm like, dude, I'm flying into this place. I can't bring my stuff with me. You know what I mean? Oh, you, this is gar. And he just kept going on. And everybody else watching the live video was like, dude, we get it. You don't like this. What are you doing here? Hmm. You know? Right. So I deal with that frequently. Um, I don't understand why I have to deal with it all the time, to be honest, because I'm not sitting. I'm not sitting there on camera, you know, proclaiming that analog and tube gear is crap like i'm just not doing that i'm saying that it's great but for certain situations you can't do that and this is an excellent alternative uh when you can't bring out all your gear like i watch these rig rundown videos like i saw one on bon jovi um and john shanks is the guitar player now on bon jovi and he has you know a rack of five gorgeous tube amps and and studio gear and pedal drawers and 30 guitars with him. Yeah, that would be awesome. I would love to do that. That's great. But I can't. So this thing is for for not being able to do that and only having a limited amount of uh, space on the carry-on cases that we bring with us on the planes, this thing is rocking my world because it's doing all of that stuff and it's I'm really satisfied with the sound and the feel of it. Uh, and and the, the real the really hilarious thing about all of these uh, criticisms is if you think about it because now we're all we're all geeks and tech minded guys here if you think about it a tube amp right so say you go to see Joe Bonamassa who's phenomenal and has the most amazing gear ever right he's got this beautiful pristine example of let's say a Marshall on stage right okay let's look at that though that's going it's being mic'd up Right. OK, great. That's going into a board. And I would guess 90 percent of the time that's a digital board. So it's going through a digital converter right from the board. Then it's going to most likely a digitally controlled amplifier with digital processing. Right. It's going through on the front of the house, digital EQ, maybe digital effects. Right. And then sent to the speakers. So what is the difference between that and what I'm doing? Because at one point. At the Helix, there was a real amplifier. It went through a microphone, and then it was digitally processed. So both sounds are going through a digital process. So you mean to tell me that going through that digital process is what makes this wrong? It's te If you think about it, now I'm sure someone who's smarter than me can argue, well, it's not really the same thing. But it kind of is. You're both going through that stage of digital processing, and that's what you're hearing. You're not hearing the the, the stage volume. You're hearing whatever that microphone's picking up and going through the converter. So that's my argument. It's kind of the same thing, you know, If then the tech is good enough where it sounds pretty close. So Yeah, I was actually going to uh, castigate you just a little bit because you started your entire discussion there uh, conceding the, the fact that digital isn't as good as physical. And then you kind of brought it around and said that it's all digital anyway. Uh, but I, I don't think that we uh, we should concede that. Uh, that point that, that you you said you know uh, analog is great but if 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 I don't think you need all those ifs this is a viable way to produce the sound that you need 
and it's just a different way than what you like. And, and I don't think that uh, that it's just a, a, a trade-off if you can't get your, your big gear on an airplane. Um, well, f- at this point for me, um, just because I have everything so dialed in, um, if, even if I could bring a bunch of stuff, I'd probably use the Helix, and the Helix would even be part of it. So if I could have a monster mega rig where I had, you know, in my garage back there, I have a, a shelf full of tube amps. I'd probably bring them out and have, but have the Helix control everything and have it linked in there. Um, but you know, you, you sort of, that's the attitude you have to have. And yes, I, I think the digital stuff does a lot of stuff better than the traditional gear, but you, that's the attitude you have to come at it from when, when people feel threatened. Because a lot of people, purists, feel threatened by this stuff. They said, oh, my God, I just spent, you know, I have $20,000 worth of gear in my house uh, that I've collected over a lifetime. And now you're telling me that this $1,500 box can do it better? Screw you. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the mindset these people are coming from. So if you want to win them over, the, the, you know, the way to do it is not to say, hey, this is better. You're an idiot. It's to say, look, what you have is great. But this works too, and, and and this doesn't. And and what my point is not that it's better. This doesn't invalidate the the real stuff, and and or vice versa. The real stuff. Th- there's things that this can do that that can't do, and the other way around. You know. So that's there's room for everybody, but for the convenience factor, for the cost factor, for the lack of maintenance that you you know you don't have to do maintenance. You don't have to change tubes out on this thing every year or two. This wins in a lot of arenas yeah and it's 100 percent reproducible regardless of temperature and humidity and environmental conditions um, right and, and the best thing is i have all of my presets in a dropbox so if we're in the middle of you know whatever in the midwest and something happens someone spills a beer on my rig i can go to a store and pick one up and lo- and be ready to go for showtime again that's a beautiful thing well the other thing i was going to add to this i mean with your recording engineering background i've never heard of a Line 6 Helix hum like an old <laughs> amp does or cut out. There's never going to be a ground loop you know, problem. <laughs> you don't deal with the, the – it's like the the older uh, – look, I have some pretty amazing tube amps myself, um, but I couldn't even imagine carrying them to the sort of gigs that you have to do. And let alone that, um, I wouldn't even want them to be – I mean, they're going to get damaged. They're going to get falling over on planes or in trucks. I mean, there's no way I'd want to want to sacrifice them to the elements like that. Um, you've got a far more practical solution right there. And I don't think if, – if from my experience, I don't think I saw any reduction in sound quality whatsoever. I was blown away by the way technology has come around. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, the – it's it's finally at a point where I think it, it sounds just as good, you know, especially in the context of a mix. And I mean, yeah, maybe it doesn't have all the nuances of, of playing an amp in your room. But again, like I said earlier, we're not going for that. We're going for the mic'd up sound. That's the goal because that's what the audience hears. Um, yeah, I it, it there are a lot of guitar players I know uh, who do have the, tradi- the, the traditional stuff. They'll look at my rig and they'll be like, I don't know. But, you know, I'm really tired of carrying my amp. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it comes down to. It's like a back saver after a while. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of great, great options because now you, um, Seth asked me before about do I get any grief from purists. Uh, there's a whole other level of grief with this stuff. There are different camps of which modeler is the best. Right. That's a whole other conversation. And that's when you get the real nerds to come out. And, 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 and nerd rage is real, man. Uh, and that's the people who it's like Axe Effects versus Kemper versus a uh, bias. That's a new thing uh, versus Helix and other software things. And these, oh, yours sounds better. Mine sounds better. I'm like, they're all good. You know what I mean? They're all good. You could, you could probably download an app for your phone that does guitar sounds. And if you manipulate it the right way, it, you won't be able to tell in a mix. It's just technology's gotten very good with this stuff. And it's and the the thing that amazes me is. Instead of embracing it, a lot of people are saying, oh, this is crap. I don't want to use this. I'm like, but this is for you. This right. is to make your life easier. 
<laughs> so here's what you do. You get somebody like local to bring up a big, huge double stack of amps and everything. And then you just go up there and you fiddle some knobs and your cable goes behind it to your helix. <laughs> and then everybody's happy. You know, you know how long bands 99 people like, wouldn't I be heard, able to tell. Uh, I heard a, a, I shouldn't say the name of the band, but anyway, this band had all, you know, huge stacks of marshals. And then behind them, they had the little old school kidney pods going. They were, had, they were just for show. You know how many bands do that? Yeah. They're just the amps on stage. They're just decoration. That's it. It's all all modeling. Well, I've done some some live recording. Certainly not uh, a studio uh, stadium venues, uh, but I can tell you, unless you're in a bar, nobody hears that stage mix anyway. You no. what you hear is what the sound man wants you to hear. Mm hmm. Exactly. And you know, with with in ear monitors, it's gotten really good now because you can bring your stage volume way down and then the front of house guy can actually mix, which is a big difference from how it was maybe 20 years ago. Wow. Hey, uh, I wanted to ask you a YouTube question. Um, a lot of people on YouTube are doing it to try to get like revenue. They're trying to make a living on YouTube. You've obviously had some big hits on YouTube. Is that viable? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, not for me. Um, YouTube, it's it's like pocket change. That's that's what you get from that. Um, the the issue I have is my most popular videos are cover songs, so that's a revenue sharing situation. So you get a percentage of it, not the whole thing, uh, which is fine. And I think that's look. Kudos to YouTube for not taking off everybody's covers because it's totally within their rights to do that. You know, and there are some. Uh, Listen, we have over 100 videos on our YouTube, and I'd say about two or three have gotten taken off because the publisher of them wouldn't allow us to post them on YouTube in the United States, and I can mm. tell you what those songs are. It was the Logical song from uh, Super Tramp, mm -hmm. um, Kisses on My List from Hall and & Oates, and Life in the Fast Lane by the Eagles. Those got, those got blocked uh, by YouTube. But everything else, the other 100 songs or so, they're up there freely. Uh, YouTube puts an ad on there, and, and we collect a little money. But it's not. I mean, the, the thing is, my, my YouTube channel does okay, but the people who are actually getting steady checks from this are the people who, every time they put up a video, it's minimum of 100,000 views, and uh, they can crank out three or four of these a week. And when those kinds of people, maybe they can make maybe $1,000 or so a month from YouTube. I'm nowhere near that. Okay. My, okay. my, the way I work YouTube, um, for my own benefit is that it's, and I, and I think everybody should be doing this. My YouTube channel is my business card. You know, it's, that's my demo. That's my reel. Anybody who wants to see what I can do, go to my YouTube channel. That's it. Those are all the things I'm involved in. And that leads to other projects for me, which I do get paid for. So that's, that's why I keep doing it. Uh, if you look at it, if you try to look at it as direct revenue from YouTube, no, it's ridiculous. It's nothing. And that's how, like, the whole music business is. Uh, people, streaming pays next to nothing. But it's, you have to be flexible and, and say, okay, this can lead to something else. So I have to keep doing these YouTube videos because they're good promotion and it's good to have stuff up there. It's just, it's good to create content and share it with people so they know what you can do. Mm-hmm. Now, Richie, well, I, I want to uh, be respectful of your time. I know that you're a busy guy, and we're we're nearing uh, an hour here. Uh, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we haven't covered? Anything that you wanted to say? Any any message you wanted to get out or anything? When I heard um, "geek" in the title, I thought we were going to talk about sci-fi and comic books, and I'm a little <laughs> bummed that we didn't. <laughs> Let's do it. That'll be next time you come on. Um, what's your favorite Star Wars fan theory about Ray? Oh, okay. My favorite Star Wars fan theory about Rey is that she's Obi Wan's granddaughter. That's my favorite fan theory. All right. And that, and that right. there's like that twenty year gap when he's in the desert and maybe he hooked up and and that led to something else because that's totally possible. I did the math. I have a chart. <laughs> Brilliant. Now, okay, you went to the you went to a convention recently, right? I did. Oh man, you're hardcore. <laughs> I went to I went to a Star Wars convention. Uh, I'd never been to a convention like that ever in my life, and it was 
it happened during a time when I was off from BOC and it was in a city where my cousin lived. So I was like, I have to go to this. This is just meant to be. I went. Um, it was fun. It wasn't exactly my cup of tea, but I'm glad I went. It was it was an experience. Let's put it that way. I went to one wow. con a, a, a while back. It was in uh, uh, Houston at on the NASA grounds. So it was a different class of of nerds there. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot of a lot of hard science nerds. And I'm telling you, I I have I'm not even in the class of of geeks. The, the, I, I don't even deserve to call myself a geek. As That's how to I felt people. at the Star Wars convention. Like I went like, oh, I'm a geek. I'm going to be with my people. And then I saw people really going for it. I said, oh, I'm not nearly as hardcore as I once thought I was. I'm, I'm sort of geek light. <laughs> I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, every time, the, every year that Comic-Con comes around, I'm like, should I go? And then I, I weasel out. I get scared of it because I know that I'm going to go there and there's these hardcore geeks and I'm just going to be going, oh, okay, this is just even too freaky for me. So I've got to get out I, of here. I, ha- I had an, uh, I have... One of the jokes on my podcast is that I wear the same costume for Halloween every year for the last 17 years or so, and uh, it's I have an Obi Wan Kenobi costume that it's every Halloween that's what I wear, and I had it in my suitcase when I went to celebration, and I didn't wear it the first day. I said, let me just sort of scope things out, and I saw like 500 Obi Wan Kenobis. They looked fantastic. I said, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave that in my suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna be wearing this and embarrass myself because these guys they have everything perfect they have the perfect material everything's cut to spec they have the food pellets the utility package um pouches on their belt they have the regulation boots and i'm like i'm i'm small potatoes i'm an amateur i can't <laughs> can do it in, in my limited experience with that though is is the guy wearing a an iron man suit made out of styrofoam and cardboard uh will get some great compliment from this dude wearing this uh screen perfect representation saying hey that's nice work man because they, they really want to encourage people uh instead of discourage at least that's been my experience so if you oh, had worn every- the 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 obi-wan light i think you probably would have been felt right at home oh yeah yeah it's just you know when you, it just sort of def- deflated me because I also like, oh, I got this cool Obi-Wan costume. I'm at a Star Wars convention. How many of those am I going to see? Probably not right. too many. But it's just it was the, the sheer amount. I said, yeah, I, I'm not going to be adding yeah. anything to this by wearing this uh, this getup. So would all the Obi Wans please take stage like all the Obi Wans? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, we this show we talk about uh, anything from from uh, politics to religion to to news, uh, uh, tech news to whatever. And today it happened to be music. Uh, the next time you come back, I promise I won't mention music at all. How about no, that? it's okay. I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> I, I like talking about music, but uh, uh, you know, I I wear my uh, my fandom on my sleeve a lot of the time. So that's I, you know, I'm I know. very happy to talk about music, especially the tech about it. Oh, one thing you know we should talk about really quick is this guitar because I'm playing it. Um, I was actually going to talk about that, so t- This go. is a Line 6 Variax guitar, and this is very, very cool. So check this out. Um, does anybody, um, Miles, you play guitar? Yeah, yeah. Is anybody else a guitar player here? I'm a bass player. Okay, well, th- this, this will apply to you, too. So check this out. So I have my sound here, and say I'm playing, playing a song, right? And the singer tells me, ah, too high for me. Using this Variax guitar, I can do. I can transpose the entire guitar down a whole step, a half step, or a whole step. I also have different kinds kinds of tones I could use. I can switch to say to a. That's because, in the truest sense, that's not a real guitar. It's a it's a synthesizer. It's a it's a digital processing device that is shaped like a a modeling guitar. guitar. Yeah. Got my 12 string. I got my acoustic sounds too. I'll show you some of those. I bet there's a flute in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um. Or if you want to go really crazy, you can go. Um. Um. Where is this? I'm sorry. <laughs> Got the sitar. There's a banjo in here somewhere. Of course, now I can't get to it. Great. Anyway. <laughs> here it is. Can you can you play bass on it as well? I can't find the banjo. Got a anyway. dobro. Can, can you play? Can, hey Richie, can you play bass on it as well? 
you can um, you can you can transpose this down an octave. Uh, I don't think I have that set up and ready to go. I'd have to program that. Oh, wait, maybe. Hold on. Let me see something here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's sort of a cognitive dissonance going on that I'm watching you play a guitar. I'm hearing you play a bass. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, this is a cool thing. This is a modeling guitar um it has traditional pickups in it that i can activate it when i want to but it also has um these piezo saddles that go to a computer on board and you can model strats tellies les pauls rickenbackers uh hollow bodies gretches jazz boxes acoustic guitars 12 strings uh sitar dobro uh, banjo and and more and then when you don't have any of that, you can plug it into just a regular amp out of the. Yeah, it's got with a regular, regular. I mean, right yeah. now I'm plugged in Ethernet because uh, that's providing power, but it also has a quarter inch jack that you can plug into a regular amp. Uh, this is not my main guitar, but this is something I use quite a lot in the studio, especially for the band geek stuff when I have to get you know wacky sounds or do some crazy switching. I do bring this out every once in a while to a Blue Oyster Cult gig, and they love it because all of a sudden they'll hear in. You know, we play all electric all the time, but sometimes when I bring this, I'll play the acoustic parts to the songs, and they'll, and Buck will look at me, and his his whole face will light up like, oh, that's awesome, you know. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's it's a nice. Uh, it's I think every guitar player should have a Variax, absolutely, because you know this this fills in all of the gaps that you might have in your traditional guitar collection. And they're not terribly expensive as far as guitars go. Nope, I think it's what like eight hundred bucks yeah, or something. Eight hundred. Oh, that's all right. That's yeah. cheap. I yep. think so, yeah. This oh, is wow. and this one, this is the cheap one. This is the Variac standard. Um and I have one of the more expensive ones and I actually like this one better because I like the neck better and this is essentially a Yamaha Pacifica guitar uh just with the line 6 guts. And I changed the magnetics to DiMarzios because I'm a big fan of DiMarzio pickups. Sweet. Normally I use uh I should say this while I'm on this. Normally I use Ernie Ball guitars. I have a uh, a nice collection of those behind me. And those are awesome. My main guitar is a uh, Ernie Ball Axis in a custom color called Slime Burst, which I love. And, uh, oh, another thing, another shout-out i got to give. Um, right now you're listening to me on an Audio-Technica microphone. Please check out Audio-Technica. They're the greatest. Uh, Seth is using an Audio-Technica. Uh, Miles, aren't yep. you as well? No, I'm, no okay. I'm on a road. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Audio-Technica. Yeah. I've been I've been using them ever since I got my first recording gear when I was like 12. And I I had an only mic I had was an Audio Technica mic, and when I started doing this professionally, I just stuck with them. And I'm a fan, I'm a fan of uh, their products, and and more importantly, uh, what they offer for the affordable price range. Because a lot of audio companies, the high end microphone companies, you can't touch anything they use for under a thousand dollars. Like anything they anything good for under a thousand dollars, but in that like you know, under a thousand dollar, three hundred to eight hundred dollar range. Audio Technica makes some really nice sounding, incredible stuff. All right, this is the the question I always ask everybody at the end of the interview. If if nobody hears anything but the last the, the next thirty seconds of what you say, what's the one message that you'd wish everybody would hear from you? Hmm. Okay, the message I want everybody to hear from me is: make sure you support the music you like. If you like a band buy their album. That's the best thing you can do. And when they come around, go see them live because that's what allows them to keep doing it. So support the music you like and don't support the music you don't like so you don't have to hear it anymore. But uh, <laughs> take, you know, make, sure, make sure you provide financial support and it's only like 10 bucks usually for an album and get it. I know it's easy to get it on YouTube or on Spotify, but it really helps the artist when you do that. And uh, yeah, and... That's basically it, and may the force be with everybody. <laughs> and that's been a running theme of this show for a long time. Pay for what you like. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's. Just, I mean, that's the most important thing because we've we've killed our own art industry, which is crazy, you know. And I I was teaching for a while, for about ten years. I was teaching guitar students, young people, and they'd say, "Oh, I want to like my favorite band is say Avenged Sevenfold, right?" They said, "I want to learn an Avenged Sevenfold song." I'm like, "Okay, you know, pull up the album on your iPod or whatever." And they'd be like, oh, no, just listen to it on YouTube. I say, wait, this is your favorite band and you listen to them on YouTube? Do you realize how stupid that is? You know, th when, when they stop making records, you're going to be sad. And, and they stop making them because you didn't pay for it. 
So yeah, pay, pay for pay for his stuff if you like it. You know, if you really like something, make sure you, that that's the best way to show your support. With you know what, that carries over anything. You like something, give that something money. It doesn't have to be a lot. You don't have to say, oh, I have to give Avenge Sevenfold five hundred dollars. No, you can give them ten bucks to, for their album, and and it, it'll it makes a difference. Well said. Hey, Richie, could I impose upon you to play us out? Yeah. Uh, what do you want? <laughs> Whatever you want to play, man. Okay, hold on. Let me get my sound. That was perfect. Right, I couldn't have asked for anything better. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for having me on. Oh, Thank thanks for being for with us, being man. With this. Oh, that My was amazing. Pleasure. That was so much fun. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, do you want me to send you this file now? Uh, yeah. If you could, uh, like, if you got uh, Dropbox, if you could send me a link to it, that'd be perfect. Uh, MP3. Uh, sure. Okay. Cool. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Nice meeting everybody. It's great. Okay, and you honestly, you're, you. please come back any other time. That'd be great. Yeah, this was fun. I like to hang, man. Anytime. All right. See ya. Excellent. See, See ya. ya. All right. So let's do. You know what? I don't even. I'm not even going to do a wrap up. His his playing is going to be the last thing that we hear on this show. So that's that's a good idea. We're going to go back and uh, <laughs> I'll do all the uh, contact us stuff at the beginning of the show. Um, yeah, he's a lot of fun, huh? Yeah. Um, let's just go ahead and keep the recordings going, and then I'll just okay. loop back and make a marker here. Start of show. Put a pin in it so we can circle back around. I said loop back. That's that's different. Hey, uh, uh, just uh, before we get going, I just got a photographic text from my daughter who just got her car fixed in Mexico. And I tell you what, the photo of this work that she sent, phenomenal. <laughs> Phenomenal, man! Cool. I, ra- I raised a tight one. <laughs> oh my! I'm I'm so proud. <laughs> yeah. That's that, to know that 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 ethos is carrying on another generation. Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, oh man. great stuff, man! I'm just so excited. All right, let's do let's do a let's do a show, shall we? <laughs> sure. Uh, let me uh, marker over here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Geek Rant, episode 284, The Band Geek, recorded May 7th, 2017, and brought to you by Element OP Productions, elementopie.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the only place on the internet where geeks rant. I am your host, Mark, sometimes known as the Sultan of the Soapbox Cockerel, and joining me this week, as always, are your two stalwart co-hosts, Seth the Gooey Kid Anderson and Miles the Aussie Janeer Wakeham. Hello, gentlemen. I'm forced to speak at last. <laughs> and I'm stuck in a freaking dust storm in Phoenix. Oh. Um, no dust here, but lots of rain. Lots of storm, just no dust. Um, I, I just, uh, just a little inside baseball here. We, are, we have just recorded uh, the interview that you're about to hear. Um, so that's why Seth he says he's forced to speak, because we were talking about music, and um, I, I was reminded of that Far Side comic where the guy was talking to his dog Fido and all the dog heard was blah 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 Fido blah 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 Fido blah 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 Fido I, I imagine Seth going blah 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 Seth what do you think uh, <laughs> uh I heard music uh, <laughs> it sounded good <laughs> So Miles and I had a lot of fun with an interview you're about to hear with uh, with Richie Castellano, the guitarist, uh, the rhythm guitarist of uh, a Blue Oyster Cult. So we're super excited to to have him uh, with you, and you'll hear that uh, a little bit uh, on. But first, we have to talk about the mindless stuff that we like to, like to talk about. And I just saw yesterday uh, the arrival. Uh, Amy Adams, uh, Hawkeye, can't remember his real name. Um, 
Uh, and Jeremy something, right? Yeah, Jeremy Renner. That's it. Yeah. Um, I still don't know if I liked it. Twenty four hours later, I'm still not sure. Um, it was it was kind of Stanley Kubrick ish. It was just odd, just odd all the way around. Um, I can't really say you should go see it, but I don't think you'll regret it if you do. Yeah, I talked about this uh, a couple months ago. Maybe I really I enjoyed it. I thought it was really good, but. You know, I, I would enjoy Amy Adams doing pretty much anything. So, yeah. Um, but it was, but I, it was a good movie and it wasn't just, you know, I think I saw it not too long after the um, fan film Independence Day sequel. And um, it was just so bad that this movie <laughs> made it seem so much more awesome. Oh, hey, um, speaking of, I have seen, okay, you know, there was Battleship, the Hasbro movie. Yes. Well, there was a, of course, you know, the Asylum came out with American Warship. Somebody went to the premiere and said, hey, we can do that tomorrow. And so they, and, you know, of course, cheesy special effects, uh, actors not, you know, not up to this. But I got to say, I think the film was better. Now, the dialogue inside couldn't compare because, you know, they didn't have but 10 minutes to do the dialogue. (laughs) But... I got to say, I think that movie, American Warships, now, not in production value, but just if you sit back and watch them both, I think, I wish American Warships would have had the big budget and Battleship would have had the little budget because I think they would have been a lot better. So um, I think it would have made both movies better if they could have switched out. So, all right. I'm just waiting for them to do a movie on shoots and ladders. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I was trying to think of a clever tagline. I can't come up with it. Uh, <laughs> not the cherries. Um, uh, and and just a, a this is a first Slides time. And stools would be the asylum. There version. you go. So there you go. <laughs> this is the first time ever uh, I had a negative Craigslist experience. I just uh-huh. you know I've been so positive about Craigslist. I uh, uh, a guy had you know I I told Miles and Seth that we recorded. Uh, pre-recorded a show yesterday. I said that today I was going to go pick, be picking up some outdoor furniture uh, from a guy there. Uh, I've mentioned here on the show that we were um, looking to uh, to get some outdoor furniture, and so I was talking with the guy, and and we we settled on a price, and he was like, I, "I want you to send me a picture of your driver's license since you're coming to my home, so I can you know know you want to see." I thought, well, that's an odd thing, but I, I snapped a picture and. And blurred out everything but my uh, my picture, so you know, and my name, so he didn't have my driver's license number and all that. Uh, and um, and then I was all ready to go, and I was going to go after church today. I had some friends lined up. It was more stuff that I could put in in one truck, so I had two trucks and a couple of guys. And then uh, we're about ready to head out, and he sends me a text says, "Yeah, I already sold it. Sorry." Uh, uh, what? And, and he was he was going for the identity theft with the driver's license. He probably never had it. Maybe I don't know. Uh, I mean, oh, what the driver's license is a fairly public piece of information, and I considered that. I mean, what what information could he get off of that that isn't already public knowledge? That that a fifty dollar Freedom of Information Act at the courthouse couldn't give him. Well, well, that's fifty dollars versus is, getting it for free. Yeah, but why would you need it? I mean, you're paying the guy cash. Well, I mean, it was just you know I don't want some some sketchy guy coming to my house. I want to see that you're you know uh, see you coming. I guess, but that's the way I took it. He was he was just looking at us as a security thing. Okay. Because okay. uh, you know it was some fairly expensive stuff, so I assumed he was in a fairly expensive neighborhood, and uh, you know uh, you know I, I didn't I thought it was an odd request, but it didn't immediately make me uh, think this guy's a crook. But I sent him. I did take the time to blur out all the other information. Mm-hmm. Well done. Um, so anyway, uh, Craigslist. I mean, it's it's not like he uh, killed me or anything. It wasn't uh, a super negative experience, but it was my first time uh, so far. I've had really stellar Craigslist Craigslist experiences all around. So just thought yeah. I'd share that with you. I yeah. bought a um, an SSD hard drive. That's redundant, I know, but off of <laughs> Craigslist, and I didn't take a laptop to check it out, and of course it was dead when I got home. Oh, so. Yeah, I mean, okay, if I ever buy computer equipment, I'm taking like a generator <laughs> and a case and say, uh, we're going to test this thing out first. Well, you don't need a generator. You just need a laptop. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and so, Seth, you had a, a much different experience yesterday that I hope was much more positive than my Craigslist experience. Yes, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, um, Volume 2. I went and I saw it, and, okay, only in comparison to the first one, it wasn't good. But it was a good movie. So they didn't, like, tread the depths of, uh, you know, Avengers' brief appearance of Ultron or any of the other Iron Man movies. But um, it was a good, it was a good, solid Marvel movie. It it did, I mean, I don't know that they could recapture the genius of the first Guardians of the Galaxy, but it was it was good. I did not like how they did. There's five scenes. If you go, you have to say there's five scenes interspersed throughout the credits. But it's like in all the other movies, the scenes are kind of teasing something that's going to come later. These were scenes that like were just the ending, you know, scenes about the movie so in that sense i kind of didn't like them but i mean they were funny and they were good but it was like they were to extend the movie rather than build the universe so but it was a good movie i enjoyed it you know it lots of fun stuff in it uh there's lots of action you know good screen i saw it 3d um just why not and uh very very enjoyable experience um i'm glad i saw it in 3d it was just a, it was a good movie, but like I say, only in comparison to the first one, I would say it's not good. So that's but, the first even remotely negative review I've heard of that movie. Everybody else I've talked to has said that it's great. It's even better than the first one. So that's that's interesting. To, I mean, I don't know. To me, to me, it wasn't as good as the first one. But you know, that's just I liked the interplay of the characters. It, it just it didn't seem to. It was good. It just wasn't as good as the first one for me. All right. And then, of course, Miles is all about documentaries. I, I On his recommendation, I watched the uh, Silicon Cowboys uh, documentary on Netflix, uh, The Story of Compaq uh, in Houston. I, you know, I knew most of that. I grew up around that. I was from Texas in that time. Um, there wasn't a lot of new information there, but it was uh, – uh, it was presented in a way that was educational. And my 13-year-old, th- uh, uh, almost 13-year-old, uh, did sit down with me and, and was interested in it for a few minutes. So in that sense of you know historical, uh, taking something historical and making it at least vaguely interesting to a 13-year-old, it was good in that regard. Uh, but you saw a yet another documentary, Miles. Yeah, I saw Risk, the uh, Julian Assange documentary. And it's only it only came out on Friday, and it's only been in kind of boutique art theaters around the place it's not out for general release yet from what i understand um but i saw it and um it's weird i you know i my head is spinning around and around on this whole julian assange thing because the guys from where i come from and we kind of i don't we didn't hang in the same circles or anything but you know i i understand where he came from i understand what the computer clubs were like in Melbourne where he kind of grew up because I was in Adelaide where, where I grew up. And I understand the, his nature. I understand his, his, the hacker mentality and all that sort of thing. And I don't hold anybody to blame for that. Um, I think that he took an enormous risk unto himself by deciding that he wanted to create something he could save the world and make transparent information and everything. And this movie... Um, is a Laura Poitras movie. Uh, she's the uh, lady who did Citizen Four on the Edward Snowden thing. And it's done very much in the same way. It's like she's in the room with him and the movie tracks from somewhere around about 2008, I think it is, maybe a little later, um, footage that she was catching being involved with that group all through the UK. I'm sorry, maybe it's 2010, something like that. Um, all the way through to present day. And it's fascinating to see the footage of what's going on behind the scenes with this guy, you know, where he's in uh, at the start of the movie. It starts him off where he's in the um, he's in a place in Norfolk, England, where he's been kind of committed to house arrest, if you like. And then they're fighting against extradition and and all that sort of stuff. And then eventually he escapes into the Ecuadorian embassy. And it's all the footage covers the whole thing. Um so as a as a historical movie, it's brilliant, uh, absolutely brilliant. 
it does not in any way attempt to try to promote or not promote his cause. It's very good in that it doesn't do that. Hmm. But you walk away from it wondering whether or not you thought you used to like what the guy did and then you didn't like what the guy did and now you don't know what you like or you don't like anymore. What's up? What's down? Who knows? But it was a good movie. So, yeah, I'd say watch it. When it eventually comes out in general circulation, it's worth seeing. All right. I, I Julian Assange, uh, in my uh, mind, is like any other vigilante. Um, he did a good thing in an illegal way. And I am I'm anti-vigilante uh, for that very reason. You, uh, you can't uh, s- suborn... Uh, or, or that's not the right word. You can't, uh, you can't ditch uh, law and decency in the name of law and decency. Um, and I, and I, I, we've had this discussion before. Uh, I am definitely in the uh, um, uh, minority in believing that. But I just, I just think that there's a proper way to do things, and and th- he didn't do it. It's Edward Snowden, the same thing. So um, I, I appreciate the fact that they seem, at least from your point of view, took a, a neutral approach to that. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think good documentaries should do that. Just report the facts. Don't try to don't try to uh, you know add context. Just tell the story. Right. That's why you think uh, Michael Moore is such a great movie maker, right? Well, Michael Moore doesn't tell the story. Exactly right. He tells he 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 starts with a story and then applies film footage. So yeah, exactly. He's the exact opposite of what I like. Um, I, I I feel like Michael Moore's films are right up there with uh, you know Big Brother and The Bachelor, um, <laughs> um, and then you uh, I, I I have not seen anything other than the original Fargo movie, um, so I don't know anything about season one. But apparently Miles season two is doing well. No season three. Season three. Uh, okay. Yeah, it it is. I, I got to say, it's a golden age right now in television. Um, some of my favorite shows are out and they're outstanding. Like I, I love that better call soul show. If you guys ever watch breaking bad, this is kind of a spinoff from that. Um, phenomenal storytelling. Um, but then, then I stumbled upon the first season of the Cohen. Is it the Cohen brothers? No, I'm, I'm going to get flamed on this one. Um, anyway, whoever put Fargo together originally, the, the movie, um, they put together a, I think, a six-episode uh, TV series on FX. Got some phenomenal actors involved in it. Uh, Martin Freeman, uh, the guy who played The Hobbit, uh, and uh, played uh, Bilbo in The Hobbit, and amongst other amazing things. He's on Sherlock. He was in it. Um, Billy Bob Thornton is the villain in it, and amazing acting some of the best i've seen in years uh but the first season of fargo was phenomenal uh you know cinematography great storytelling the whole bit but very 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 violent i mean really violent and i it was not too violent where i could not watch it but there was always that aspect to it um but it was amazing television experience and then the season two came out and season two was uber violent. I mean, from episode <laughs> one, it was blood on the walls and the whole bit. And it, and I just could not get in. I could not get past episode one, even though I loved the previous series. I couldn't get past episode one. So then, episode uh, series three comes out. So my immediate thought is, I'm going cautiously into this because if this thing is over the top stupid violent the whole bit they've sold themselves out for shock value i'm not going to be past episode one well they've done three episodes so far and i gotta tell you i am so hooked on this thing it is the coolest storytelling uh, apparently a true story it's got um uh, ewan mcgregor is acting in it but he plays two characters uh which is phenomenal and they are completely opposite characters. I mean, it, if you were to ever challenge an actor to really come up and do their thing, this was the canvas he needed to be painted on. And he has risen to the challenge. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, 
so yeah if you haven't seen it, it's on fx uh but check it out fargo the third series you do not need to have watched the previous ones okay. because what they what they do is they just take a a bizarre criminal murder story that is just ridiculously weird and they turn it into hollywood and they do a beautiful job at it so are there are the any characters the same or is it a whole new set each one whole new set whole new place okay. whole new actors everything's brand new it's like a totally new story and if i um i might be uh, no i think i'm right in saying this um the crew that did legion that i know you watched mark yes they did this as well oh well that sold me on it right there yeah so you might be uh you might be interested in this one <laughs> All right. Although it's not not that much comic book stuff, in it, right? No, I, you know what I thought about Legion was it was a good story in spite of the fact that it was in the Marvel Marvel universe. Uh, that actually, if anything, took away from it. Um, mm. But anyway, um, I, there's something I just wanted to mention in in the um, it's got a lot of potential, but it hasn't used it yet. Category, uh, I think it's on NBC. Uh, powerless. Um, it's it's in the DC universe, uh, and it's. Um, it's Wayne Corp, but not Bruce Wayne. It's uh, Bruce Wayne's cousin um, running uh, uh, Wayne Corp, and I'm blanking on on the character's name. But anyway, um, the this this version of Wayne Corp sells um, uh, superhero survival stuff, like the Rubble Poncho. When superheroes are fighting and rubble falls on you, you need to be able to pull out the Rubble Poncho to protect yourself. Uh, or when Doctor Psycho gases the entire city, pull out your Wayne Corp gas mask and continue on with your day and uh, it, like i said the 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 premise is brilliant and it's got one of my favorite actors ever in it alan tudyk uh who was wash uh from um oh yeah firefly uh who's been uh you know he was uh in first night he was in uh the voice of every character you've ever liked in any animated movie was probably alan tudyk um and he uh really is the only reason I'm still watching it <laughs> uh, because I keep waiting for it to get good. It's, you know, it started bad. It got a little better and now it's up to okay. Uh, so maybe it's going to get better, but it's on, uh, I think it's NBC. Uh, I think there are eight episodes in now. Um, so it's, it's worth checking out uh, just for the, the camp factor. It's got uh, Vanessa Hudgens, uh, uh, who you may or may not know from uh, High School Musical. If you grew up in my household, there was a few years there where everything was High School Musical. Uh, she was Gabriella, uh, and they do let her sing once in a while. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fun uh, p- potential thing that just hasn't quite lived up to the potential. So, uh, Seth, I really think you might like it a lot. I probably would. There was a uh, a comic book years ago set in the Marvel Universe, and it was called Damage Control. And they were the people who rebuilt after all the superhero battles. And it was like a little mini series, and it was hilarious because it was just like it was like a con- a construction company and cleanup company that. Um, anyway, it was funny, but it was like this, and I really loved it. So I would probably like it. Yeah. So the um, first episode of, of Powerless, Vanessa Hudgens is um, new girl in the big city. Uh, I forget the name of the city, uh, but there she's she's going into the city, riding the subway, first day at uh, at the new job, right out of college, and. Uh, her train gets attacked by a supervillain, and she's like, "Isn't that amazing?" And then a superhero comes in, and and she's watching the battle out the window. Everybody else in the subway is like reading their newspaper and watching the filing the nails. It's like, yeah, this happens every day. And and she <laughs> she actually looks at the window and says, "This doesn't happen every day. I, I can't believe you're not watching this." No, it does every day. Uh, <laughs> so, like I said, lots of potential there. I just hope it lives up to it. Cool. And uh, I'm not going to do any uh, um, listener feedback uh, this week or tech news because um, we're already uh, running a little long for uh, what's about an hour interview uh, with Richie. Uh, So, Seth, uh, go ahead and tell us now what happened this week in history. All right, Mark, since you asked so politely. On May the 7th, 1954, the IBM 704 was introduced. IBM announces the IBM 704 data processing system, the world's first mass-produced computer to feature floating-point arithmetic hardware. Besides this ultra-geeky distinction, the IBM 704 will leave its mark in computer history before it is discontinued on April 7th, 1963. Both 
1960. Both Fortran and Lisp programming languages were first developed for the IBM 704, as well as the first music application, Music. Physicist John Larry Kelly Jr. of Bell Labs will synthesize speech for the first time in history on an IBM 704. Not bad for a name frame. And as a show note, this is the second time the 704 has shown up in this segment of the show. Back to you, Mark. And so I was going to give you uh, just a quick uh, um, Wikipedia definition of floating point, but I can't even understand the first sentence of Wikipedia. Uh, so I'm not going to, I, I, I pride myself on being able to take complex concepts and, and give you a, a simple Reader's Digest version. No, not in the 30 seconds Seth allowed me there. Um, floating point is a thing that only computers can do. Um, and this was the it, first one to do it. And this is a great week for history stuff. I found several things. I was like, I'm going to use this one, and then, no, I'm going to use this one. No, I'm going to – and then I settled on this one. So the the first part of May, I don't know if it's like year-end bonus review or college students finishing up their projects so they can graduate, uh, but this is a great weekend for a history of computers. Yeah, uh, and uh, I believe the, the, the term that we use – I hadn't thought about that, Seth, that uh, lots of lots of technology – was done by students at universities and schools are about to get out um, and have been throughout history. Uh, wow, interesting thought. Um, but we still use teraflops, which is, or, or flops, which is uh, floating uh, point operations per second. Uh, I think we're up where, uh, I don't know what the high, highest one is right now, two teraflops or something like that, which is like two trillion floating operations per second. Is So that's still what we measure computers in, uh, their speed and their capacity. Um, and 1960 was the day. Like yep. a fast computer. And uh, uh, one of the things that I was uh, in the Silicon Valley thing was uh, they came out with the 386 processor. Uh, and it was just the, but I remember back in the day, I remember the big deal that the 386 was. And then, then you could get the, 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 the math coprocessor that went with it. Oh my gosh, you could offload all the math onto a separate processor. It made your machine so much faster. Um, and now, you know, my phone is more powerful than those computers. It's Way my watch probably is more powerful than those computers. Um, all right. Yeah. And so, uh, a little early in the show, but again, I, 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 I want to let uh, Richie finish us and, and, and you'll be gratified that I did, uh, when you hear uh, how that ended. Uh, but, uh. Uh, this is the part of the show where I'll tell you how you can contact us. Let us know what you think. Uh, you can go to elementop.com, click the Contact Us button at the top of the page, uh, fill out the world's hardest CAPTCHA, uh, fill out the form there, and um, and then that gets an email that's sent to me and gets priority in my in-basket inbox. I, I uh, interchangeably use those terms. Um, and you can... Uh, uh, also, uh, send an email to uh, geekrant at elementop.com or fi dial 559 IMOP and leave a voicemail on our Google Voice line. All of those ways uh, will be a way that you could uh, appear right here on the show with us, either in text or voice format. Uh, we, we like hearing from you. Uh, as I've said many times before, this is listener-generated uh, uh, radio, and so what you say matters. Um, and now, Seth, uh, what do you have this week to lower my productivity, thus making you seem like a better hiring option? The Mega Penny Project. Jack, Jack. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. This one. I like I don't the know reverb. It'll... That was nice. Yeah. Thank you. Special effects provided uh, by the gooey kid. So, anyway, this just tells you, like, kind of the value of a penny. Uh, it goes up to one quintillion pennies. So, if you click on one penny, it shows you kind of how big it is and all that kind of stuff. And if you go next, uh, what 16 cents is, and then there's how much a thousand pennies, then 50,000. And it shows you, like, how big that would be. And there's, like, a man beside it for um height so if you could get so into this and you're like well how much is that and then you you're gonna have to wikipedia or google this stuff to see if it's true and then your boss will say hey why don't you continue looking that up at home here's a cardboard <laughs> box for you so anyway uh, on your way out the door just email me um set the element uh what do you think mark I, I you are getting more nefarious as time goes on <laughs> It's actually very funny, this site. I like it. Eventually, Seth's link is just going to be to I want to be fired.com. <laughs> it's going to be, no, I, I, might, I might write some like cryptoware or something. 
<laughs> the last thing it does is is send you uh, send Seth the work email address of the person who's about to get fired. Uh, right. Good stuff. Hey, I, I hear you have an opening. <laughs> we haven't posted that job yet. How do you know? I uh, just you know I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you hire me, I'll tell you. <laughs> Uh, all right, and so now, without further ado, Rich, Richie Castellano of uh, of of you know I, of the Band Geek Podcast. Uh, uh, yes, he's a musician, but what he's here to talk about this week is uh, his podcast and his geekness and his love of of all things geeky. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the uh, uh, the interview as much as we enjoyed doing it. And we'll see you next week um, uh, because that's it, except for the next hour uh, for this episode <laughs> of the Geek Rant. Now, here's Richie. All right. We did it. I think that was smooth. Nobody will ever notice. No, that'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that went that went all right, didn't it? Yeah. Cool. He was a lot of fun. Yeah, he, he was. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah, hope he, he wants to come back sometime. It sounds like he does. And, you know, we'll talk about Bitcoin and, and, and he can play guitar the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, comics and you know, Bitcoin. <laughs> if we had like a Star Wars episode where, you know, we're not talking about anything but Star Wars, you know, T-shirts, memorabilia, cons, whatever, he, you know, I'd be, I'm sure he would want to come back for that. Yeah, you should do, you should do that. You should do that. But he would love it. I would have to get Netflix and dedicate a week of my life to watching <laughs> all the movies again so it would be fresh yeah. on my mind. No, I haven't watched Star Wars for years, so I'm way out of it. I love that he said he had a chart, a timeline <laughs> chart. <laughs> you know, hey, when isn't there one coming out? I think there's one coming out this year. Um, I saw a preview for it anyway uh, at the Guardians of the Galaxy. So maybe like a couple of weeks before it comes out, we could do, you know, because geeks talk about Star Wars. Is that is that this year or is it 2018? Um the, let's see, uh, I can't even remember the name of it. Next Star Wars movie. Come on, Chrome. You can do it. I believe in you. I have faith in you, Chrome. Um, the Last Jedi, December 15. Okay, 20, 2017. So, it is this year. Oh, cool. Yeah, um... That would be fun if he wants to come back in December uh, or maybe November, and uh, and we could do a spoiler cast or something. Well, no, yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, we and I would say, you know, possible spoilers to any of any movie or something up to this point, right? You know, because they will have all been out for a year. Yeah, well, I mean, Rogue One would be pretty close to a year at that point. So, okay, that I mean, you know, we could do that like in November and, you know, like reach out to him. And if he wants to, then, you know, anytime in November, that's good for him. We could do it that particular week. Just yeah, a thought. Yeah. Put yeah. that on your calendar. So we'll, uh, I mean, we're not used to planning that forehead. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, anyway, uh, I like having returned guests because you can get over that first date jitters, uh, early right. on, you know? Um, so, yeah, and, I just and, hope that they actually do a little bit of promoting that they were on our show, and here's a link to it so that we get some of their listeners coming over. Yeah. Um, but you, you know, what do you do? You can, you can lead a horse to water. Well, I mean, we yeah, I mean, we didn't invite him on to abuse that, but if that happens, no. you know, we won't mind. <laughs> right. Well, he's got a pretty big Facebook following, from what I hear. He probably has posted that you know that's going to be out. So. <laughs> All right, and this is the time where I shut down the YouTube video. Thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>